Good evening, everyone. My name is Quandra Spades, and I'm here today uh, with my co-host, Patrick Brutus, and our guest, Mike Swive Saviwe. Saviwe <laughs> Elliott. Um, thank you all for joining us, and this show is presented to you by Help One Save One. Help One Save One is a community inspired organization. Our um, goals are to inspire as well as educate the community um, on information that's designed to empower and enlighten the community. As you can see, our email address is help one say one at hotmail.com. You can please call us at 312-313-6977 and please visit us on our Facebook page. We are going to be discussing police brutality and account, police accountability today. Um, last week we discussed civic engagement with Valerie, Valerie um, Leonard and it was a great show. Please check us out on YouTube. As you, um, as mentioned in previous shows, that um, the 1968 Kerner Commissioner Report will be the foundation laying the groundwork to support the topics we will be discussing over the next several weeks and the remaining weeks we have here. Um, our our intent to create a progressive series of informal discussions regarding our journey as African American people by examining where we were, where we want to be, versus where we actually are. So with that being said, we have a very interesting topic. I'm excited to get started, and I'm going to let um, Patrick introduce our guest. Thank you. Good evening, Chicago. And uh, our guest this evening is Mike Saviwe Elliott, who is a longtime labor and community and social justice organizer and leader in the community. Originally from Detroit, he has fought for the freedom for South Africa, international worker solidarity, he is also uh, partnered with the Black Lives Matter movement, and now he is currently leading the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. That organization is C-A-A-R-P-R. That organization is fighting for a democratically elected Civilian Police Accountability Council that uh, will establish the community control of the police. Mike, yes. why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Welcome to the show. and. Glad you're here this evening to talk to us Absolutely. about this very important topic and very timely and relevant here in Chicago today. Yeah, well, I want to thank you all for inviting me uh, to have this opportunity to talk about this very important topic. And uh, I'm actually the chair of the Labor Committee of the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. Uh, <clears throat> what we've been fighting for for five years is to establish an all-elected Civilian Police Accountability Council. Um, one that will actually replace the current police structure that includes the, the police, the police board, um, COPA, mm -hmm. and internal affairs will be folded into, uh, CPAC also. So CPAC is the acronym for it. And we think it's very, it's very necessary that we change the way we've been doing business in terms of how we are approaching uh, to resolve the problem of police accountability in this city. And so far, uh, there's a long history of how the government structure, the city structure has failed to properly address that issue and these acts of police violence and brutality and corruption are still continuing. So. We, we, we believe that if we have community control of the police through an all-elected Civilian Police Accountability mm -hmm. Council, which will actually elect uh, a person from each of the 22 police districts to sit on a citywide council, mm -hmm. and also to they will establish offices in each of the neighborhoods or each of the wards mm -hmm. or police districts where uh, you know, the, the police operate in the city of, of Chicago, we'll be able to have a major impact on how the police behave in our community, uh, on the use of force issues, on, on the hiring of the police superintendent, and also the discipline of officers who have been, uh, uh, who have conducted misconduct 
and harassment throughout the city. So Mike, it sounds like it's very layered and very well thought out. I see you've written an yes. ordinance about this as well, and but it looks like it addresses uh, you know, hiring in the police districts, community policing. Yes. It also hi uh, also looks at, you know, police review in, mm -hmm. in replacing the COPA structure as it is today. And mm -hmm. this really will give more of a voice to the community residents in the city who yes. feel the impact the most on a daily basis from police protect and serve. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of questions here this evening that we want to talk to you about, and this is a very interesting topic, as you will agree at home. And please don't forget to call us in. It's a talk show. It's a call-in show, and your participation is very important. Please call us at 312-738-1080. 312-738-1080. Call in. Let us know what you're thinking and express your concerns and remarks to the guests or us or in general. Uh, Mike, so... We've got a lot of police brutality issues going on here in Chicago. Just recently this year alone, we've had three in other major cities. April 28th in California, we had a young man who was killed in the Walmart parking lot. May 9th in Miami, police actively kicked a handcuffed man while he was uh, detained. And on March 30th, also in California, Stephon Clark was shot eight times in his own backyard. Um, which leads us to this question. Do you think police uses of force in these examples were conducted within the scope of their job duties? Or would you say that there is a significant racial disparity in how police in the United States use force? Uh, try to juxtapose yeah. what's going on, you know, in other cities uh, as we yeah. also try to identify what's going on right here in Chicago. Yeah, I would say there's a, a major influence of racism in the behavior of the way police officers conduct themselves particularly in black and Latino communities. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are countless examples of how police have overreacted, have provoked, and have just uh, blatantly um, shot and injured various people uh, in, in, in black and poor communities, uh, black, Latino, and poor communities. And this is this it's been continuing um, for us uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, activists in the social justice movement. You know, it's very clear, and for people living in the community, because a five-year-old, five-year-olds are scared of the police mm -hmm. in, in black communities, mm -hmm. and there's reasons why. Right. It's because of the way they behave and disrespect, and uh, it's ironic how we are. You know, hands up, don't shoot, and then they are shooting first. Exactly. Right. I mean, if you put your hands up, they, they can say they saw a weapon in your hand and right. shoot you. Right, right. I mean, there's so many examples of that. Like, you gave some examples of some people who have been unfortunately killed uh, by the police, um, innocent folks mm -hmm. who have been killed. But in Chicago, it happens every single day. Every single day. Somebody is shot, jailed. Falsely accused of a crime, locked up, beaten. Uh, we're the only city that I know of in uh, in the United States that had to establish um, reparations mm -hmm. for for victims of police torture. Uh, I mean, this is a city that's been known to torture uh, people that they hold in custody. It's if, actually part of the budget almost on an annual basis where they set yes. aside a certain amount of high number of millions of dollars mm -hmm. to settle these cases. Yeah, after forcing people to make false right. confessions. Well, you know, actually with that, um, along those lines, I kind of wanted to read um, what the Boston University School of Public Health, um, a study that they conducted okay. on racial disparities in police violence. And their findings was released in um, a paper called The Relationship Between Structural Racism, Black-White Disparity, and Fatal Police Shootings at the State Level. They used five key indicators of um, systemic racism, racial segregation, incarceration rates, educational attainment gaps, economic disparity, and employment disparity gaps for each state. And based on their findings, none of these factors matter for African Americans. Actually, they did worse on all five fronts compared to white people. Their findings show that states like Wisconsin, Minnesota, as well as Illinois, registered as the highest on the state racism index because they have some of the highest rates of unarmed African Americans being shot by police. 
So, um, given this empirical data, data, racial disparities found in police violence can no longer be written off as a dispute over what was in the police heart when he or she pulled the trigger, or even, um, it goes even further than that, that they were afraid. Um, but the real question is based on your expert opinion. Why do you feel police officers were more likely to fatally shoot a black or brown person despite the criminal act, the neighborhood they're in, or even the, the situation, like the hands up? situation um what do you think um, are those reasons and what are the solutions if any i think that the the basic reason is racism is multi-generational mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and these police officers of today are have inherited uh, a philosophy a way of thinking of people of color uh, that actually puts us in their minds, in the classification of being less than humans than they are. We actually have a caller. Hello, caller. What's your question or comment? Thank you. I've uh, been listening to the gentleman, your guest, speak here uh, regarding uh, police brutality, brutality in the black community. Now, we know that we have a history of uh, being victimized in the black community. And I know that uh, for a fact that uh, the slave patrols were implemented uh, by way of police forces. Uh, they told the um, citizens in, in this country at one point, you, know, you must be on the slave patrol from age, if you start at age 6 to 60, uh, you're automatically in place. And these, these uh, systems have prevailed, although they've been allegedly outlawed. But there's an unwritten law of black codes. Uh, we can look at the example of citizens in this country using the police forces to to commit racism. The the incident at Yale University where the woman went to sleep in a in a study room and this woman, a white woman, called the police and uh, it turns out that she had also called the police on her friend, a uh, brother who was in uh, was seeking directions. So the Citizens are using the police to commit racism against black people, against the communities. So how do we address uh, comprehensively the issue of black people being victimized by the system? And I'll let you get back to your, your guess. Thank you for your call. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that because um, the, huge, the huge question here is, is how do we address a cultural, a culture of racism. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a culture of racism that 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 dominates the the police department and many parts of uh, of the white communities throughout the nation. And like I said, it's due to multi generational racism. You know, this has been passed on and ingrained in the minds of of many of these people uh, to look at us as being a threat, to look at us as being less than human. Um, and it, that's, you know, that's a real issue that we have to really, that we have to start considering. Right, and, so the challenge and how to challenge that. Right, so the challenge would be how do we reverse that systemic uh, part of it, right? Because it's become now a way of life. And the yeah. caller uh, correctly identified a recent trend of where white people are calling police on black people for doing regular yeah. things and the police responding yeah. ready to uh, arrest, ready to investigate, ready with force for simple things such as, you know, sleeping, like the mm -hmm. student at Yale uh, and other examples that we've seen on social media, you know, yeah. by the power of video. It's, it's just amazing. It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, I, I think one of the solutions is this new generation of young white people. That is one of the key solutions. They are, they are really stepping up mm -hmm. and challenging the, uh, the old philosophies that, that uh, their parents and family has tried to pass on to them. And they are, you know, they are actually meeting and, and hanging out with black people and black activists and Latino activists and, and learning for themselves who we are. Ms. Oh, mm -hmm. Mr. Elliott, let me let me ask you a question because I want to yeah. give you a chance to talk more in depthly about what CPAC is doing. Yes. Uh, so, if you could answer it in this way, um, 
you know, we've got a history here in Chicago with the John Burge history. Uh, now, you know, years later, we've had numerous revelations of former incarcerated individuals making these claims and being proven innocent uh, in the court of law and in the court of public opinion as well. And so, uh, if you could just uh, give us a little bit about why CPAC is necessary today. What made it come to the table so far, and how is it going to address the necessary level of monitoring that we need to control police misconduct and try to prevent it from happening in the first place with all the things that you guys have uh, planned in your strategic plan, as it were. Yes. So, just like some of the issues you, you, you just raised um, about John Burge and the, uh, the, the long history of police uh, brutality in, in the city of Chicago, uh, there have been uh, various proposals or structures set up, police structures set up mm -hmm. by the city administration, by various mayors to allegedly address this issue and all of them have failed. Um, we felt very strongly that it was time to come up with le a legislation that will empower the people to have control over how the police conduct themselves in our community. We don't want oversight of the police uh, like some of these ordinances are, are proposing. We want control of the police. So they, are you in favor or not in favor of the consent decree, which would then give the federal government some level of jurisdiction over the local police department here in Chicago? I think this, this, the dissent, the dissent con the consent decree. The, the dissent c decree <laughs> uh, will actually help a lot. Okay. So in addition, uh, CPAC, which will address issues of police violence in a whole different way now. Okay. Uh, so the police would no longer be able to shoot someone and then you can't question that cop for 48 hours. They get drilled and and rehearsed over what the response right. should be before anyone can even speak to them about it uh, on it's, a public it's level. The, it's the period of time for our listeners out there and our viewing audience. This 48-hour yeah. period is written into the union contract uh, and uh, supported by the police board and the police administration, which is, you know, coined the term as get your story straight. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, CPAC won't allow that to happen. They will have to respond immediately. Uh, to the questions that the uh, CPAC representatives will bring to them. And so there would no longer be that time for them to uh, and these would be the locally, get their stories straight. And these would be the local representatives at each, 20 sec at each of the 22 police districts. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just like when um, the police officer Jason Van Dyke killed Laquan McDonald, you know, he, he, he was folded into that 48-hour thing where they drilled him uh, and the other officers. It was right. like seven other officers right, yeah. who they all signed off right, right. on the lie that right. he told. Mm -hmm. right. uh, they won't have time to do that anymore in the CPAC. Okay. They, you know, they would have to, they would have to tell the story immediately. Mm -hmm. And that would make in a the, huge in difference. In the presence of or to the civilian representative to this, at that, uh, yes. assigned to that police district. Yes. Okay. What, I have a question. So I know Lisa Madigan, she had several um, citywide community forums uh, to fi finalize the demands to go into this mm -hmm. consent decree. Um, did you attend any of these forums that was led by the um, Attorney General's office? No, I didn't personally, but some of the members of our organization did. Mm -hmm. Okay, and but, did, mm -hmm. do you feel, did they come back and give you feedback on whether or not those activities were successful? Were they helpful? No, we didn't think they were successful at all. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of questions were raised about uh, many of the details about it that we still haven't got answered yet. Mm -hmm. But currently going on... Uh, the, the alderman, uh, Raboyas, of the 30th Ward, right. who's, the, who's the chair of, of the City Public Council Safety mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Committee, he had been holding the CPAC ordinance hostage in his committee for over two years. And it was just recently that we finally forced them to bring out 
our CPAC ordinance. It's actually an ordinance. Uh, and have it discussed in the public. They were going to have public discussions about three ordinances or three proposed ordinances on police accountability and they weren't going to include CPAC. Right. So but after we after the public after we, they received so much public pressure, they had to come out and actually add us to that panel to that to that discussion. So Mr. Elliott in the public. So Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. just for your viewers at home, uh, city council once you introduce an ordinance it gets assigned to a committee, it's been assigned to the uh, public safety committee, but yes. does it have a sponsor? Yes. It has nine, has ten sponsors. So that's great. You have ten aldermen who have signed on to this ordinance. Mm -hmm. Yet, however, it still has been languishing, uh, without being called to the right. committee for a vote, and yes. then to city council for a, an up or down pass or or reject. Right. And so, the yeah, the reason for that is CPAC will actually take the power uh, from the mayor and the city council to uh, to control the police. Mm -hmm. It will. It will give. It will empower the, the community to control the police. Mm. Well, before we, um, I know we only have a few more minutes. I wanted to ask a, a question really quickly. So, okay. civil rights um, groups issued a ten-point um, plan for anti-violence training and other reforms for Chicago police. Groups like Black Lives Matter, NAACP, the Urban League propose that the uh, officers undergo undergo anti-violence training that includes the history of police misconduct such as the torture claims um, by dozens of black suspects under um, John Burge. Do you believe training will be enough to curtail the police misconduct in Chicago? No, it won't be enough, no. Uh, it's something that we'll always have to stay vigilant about. And uh, having CPAC as an ordinance, as a law, would definitely help with uh, reduce the, the amount of police violence that we're experiencing. And CPAC is it's probably the most radical uh, police accountability ordinance in the nation right now mm -hmm. uh, because it rejects all the mayor's appointments. There will be no appointments by the mayor to CPAC. So are there any other cities in America that are using this model? Or is this uh, totally a, a totally new pilot? There is no precedent for this whatsoever in Los Angeles, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, anywhere. Well, this, this comes from the Black Panther Party. Okay. And they used it uh, in, in Oakland, California. Um, and when the, they had a mayor that was elected that implemented it, but when he lost the election, uh, the new mayor wiped it out. So that's why we thought that we would add much more to it and also, uh, as a key, make sure that it was an elected Civilian Police Accountability Council so that um, a new mayor couldn't just wipe it off the books. I find it amazing that uh, since 1968, 50 years ago, we uh, read a report issued by the federal government that studied the race riots in the 60s, and 50 years later today, we are still confronting the same challenges in regard to police brutality, mistreatment of minorities, and abuse and over-aggressive policing in America. It's just Astounding. It, it is. is. It really is. It is. Well, you yeah. know, we actually have to wrap up, so I want to thank you so much for coming out. But before we go, um, um, I know Quanja wanted to read some announcements, or Mike, you want to read your announcements? I know yeah. you've got some things yes, coming up absolutely. for well, CPAC. Well, well, you want to put it right yeah, here? Yeah, we can put it right yeah. here. But first of all, um, next week at at Gage High School, we're going to have a, a a public another public hearing on police accountability, and so. Please go to our Facebook page uh, to get more information, the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. Okay, you can also, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, But give on, the dates. Yeah. So on June 16th and 17th, Angela Davis, one of the founders of the Chicago Alliance, um, which was founded exactly 45 years ago today, this is the anniversary, the 45th anniversary, She'll be speaking um, during this weekend of people power that we're, that we're hosting at Trinity Church, uh, Trinity United Church of Christ on West 95th Street. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, we want to thank our viewers and our callers for calling in today. Um, next week, we will be uh, discussing, we have another interesting topic. We're going to actually be talking about estate planning. We hope you all could tune in. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate all the knowledge you were able to share with us today. It's my honor. And thank you, and um, have a good evening.